we have the escape room advisory board here. We don't have all the members represented today, but these are the ones that elected to participate this morning. So thank them for their time. Um, real quick, my name is Sebastian Bolton. I'm the Chief Operation Officer for the Puzzle Effect. I will be moderating the event. A couple things that I kind of want to go over before we get started. We're going to have everyone introduce themselves here in just a moment so you guys get to know who everybody is. Um, we do have some predetermined questions today. We don't have very many. Probably have about three to five questions that we've predetermined today. Um, the majority of this is going to be about your Q&A. So we want to make sure that you guys get the absolute most out of this uh, panel. So if you have questions now, great. Uh, you'll be able to ask those very shortly. If you think of questions as they're answering the predetermined questions, uh, make sure that you write those down. Um, if you have a specific member that you'd like to address that question to, make sure that you do that as you're answering the question. Uh, we will try very hard to keep the responses brief so that we can answer as many questions as possible. Um, in general, one member will probably answer the question. We'll probably allow for an additional member to either rebut or make an additional statement. But no more than about two members will answer any question. And again, that's just for the sake of time um, so that we can get as many questions answered as possible. So that being said, we will go ahead and get started. And I will kick it off right here to my left. And I'll let each panel member introduce themselves. Hello. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. All right, then I don't need <laughs> My name is Nicole Ginsberg. I am the owner of uh, Escape the Estate LLC. Uh, we have escape rooms, and then we also are currently producing the Museum of Entry. Uh, my name is Eric Jurian. I own Escape Room Wisconsin, and obviously, Wisconsin. I'm Megan Mouton. I own Clue Carre in New Orleans. Uh, Lucas Johnson, and I have uh, Locked Games LLC and LZF LLC. Uh, Amy Phillip out of Portland, Oregon. I own Escape Games PDX, and we just broke ground on a new location over the border in Washington, and the new company will be called Paradigm Cube. My name is Brian Lassertosa. I own The Puzzle Effect. Uh, we have multiple locations, Colorado and West. Beautiful. All right, well, we will get this started then. We will start out with our first question that I will open up to the panel. And that first question is, um, what are some of the key factors that you think will determine expansion or stagnation um, for current businesses in the industry today? Sure. <laughs> we, we always start with you. Okay. Um, I think in terms of stagnation is uh, a lot of people getting into the, I hate to, for lack of a better term, the Walmart effect of we can just buy it anywhere or buy anything and make it work. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that feel the stress of getting a room open and getting revenue generated over the thought process and having the right materials and doing the right thing for your business and for your customers rather than doing the right thing for your pocketbook. I know that's a very bold statement. Um, what I really mean though is be patient. It's not an explosive track. You know, any business starts small and works its way up from there. We're in an industry that most of you are probably in your second or third year, and you've probably seen huge returns. Um, that's great, but in a normal business track, that's not usually what happens. So kind of riding the ride a little bit and staying focused on what your needs are, I think is important. I'm right on. <laughs> <laughs> same. Yeah, right on the same sort of track. Um, we invest a lot of money back into what we do, and I think that's that's a huge thing for growth. Um, um, and, and and we don't have any single. Like there are people that are saying, "Oh, tech rooms are great," versus I still love a just solid base puzzle game with conventional locks, but I love the tech game. But I think it's important to invest back into your business. Yeah, so I definitely think the reinvestment for expansion is important. I think what we're seeing with some of the locations closing. Is the natural progression of where the industry is right now as far as the three-year leases are coming up. People are trying to figure out if they're going to reinvest or if they're going to just shut their doors or if they're going to flip the games and, and where we're going with that. I think also what we're seeing is because the barrier of entry has been lifted, more people are playing escape games and more people are playing better escape games. So if you think about the first one you played, or I don't know how long everybody's been in the industry, but I know that if the first game I played was more um, tech based and had these like magical reveals and things that were happening. I don't know if I would have left and been like, yeah, let's go do it. I'm gonna open this in the next couple months. I think I probably would have been like still intrigued and wanted to get into it, but not necessarily 
hit the ground running and like absolutely I'm throwing my money at this and going. So I think that with the closure of some of these locations that maybe aren't reinvesting in their product, aren't taking their time to craft the experience, um, we'll start to see the entire industry elevate as a whole. I mean, that's pretty much it. Reinvesting, just like any other business, you can't expect to continue to grow without taking the time to reinvest in your business. And basically everything else that they've said, I don't really have anything to add to that. Yeah, I feel pretty good about their answer. Um, I mean, the expansion and, and the contraction, I think the biggest thing for me is that the contraction is those that aren't running a good business. Doesn't matter what the fact that this is an escape room, but they don't have the infrastructure to succeed. They don't have HR. I'm not saying you have to hire all of this, but if you don't know HR, you need an expert that can handle HR. Um, if you don't know how to do marketing, you need a person to actually do the marketing for you. To think that a single individual can succeed long term on their own with so many different facets of running a business, I just don't know how realistic that is. Um, and, and on the expansion part, whether it's other places opening or yourself expanding, you've got to have those pieces in place. Um, if you don't, it's just I don't see how people can stay in business without all of those different pieces together. I think by add it also depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to run it for fun, you enjoy just running, you know, Thursday, Fridays, uh, Saturday, Sunday, you and your significant run it or you and a friend run it, that's a different scenario of what are you trying to do. Whereas if you are trying to expand and be in business, you have to go about it in a completely different way and you do have to have the infrastructure behind the scenes and, and everybody will tell you like, yes, there's closures happening. There's also openings happening. It's like other industries. If you check any other industry out there, the amount of closures that do happen is still a really high percentage. You know, some people just can't figure out the business side or they also realize it's a lot of work. Um, and you can hire out a lot and you can, that's totally fine. It just costs a lot more money. So it, anyway, it depends on what your goal is. And I think that's another thing is we all have, I think, similar-ish goals, but um, you guys might have something different, and that's totally okay, too. I think pending, we'll go back to everything, is you keep safety and service top of mind. You can run your business how you want. That's the best part of this industry. Yeah. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, so I know that Megan and uh, Eric kind of talked a little bit just about you know tech versus some non-tech. Uh, what are some current uh, tech trends that you're seeing in the market, and what effect do you think they're gonna have on the future of the escape room? Oh, do you want yeah, I'll, I'll bite this bullet. It's, um, so for me, tech is something that's cool, it's alluring, it's awesome, but it's kind of like, when when we opened, I was like, why are we gonna buy workstations for every employee who works here? Or why are we gonna spend so much money doing all of these elaborate things when we don't even know that the model works in our area? Now granted, when I got in, tech was very, very low. I was talking last night about, we did a lot of things magically with actor driven props because that was what was available um, as the industry has progressed and they've gone further no matter what your tech is if your story and the process of your game is not there you can have a hundred tech props in there and it's not going to make it's not going to make a difference so for me i'm extremely story based when i'm designing as well as what my team is designing now. And then we go from there based on what the need is. If we need a fireplace to open, obviously that's gonna be tech. If we need a pillar to rise, that's gonna be tech. But there's other things that to the player, we've play tested and beta tested and they have the same reaction, if not a little bit less with tech versus doing an analog self-solve and, and um, follow through with the process of the game. So for me, uh, I think that the tech is moving a lot faster than the industry is moving. And I think that a lot of people are feeling the pressure to spend a lot of money. And when we take a deep breath, slow down and realize where we're actually at, we're still in a very young business. And making those huge sweeping changes and large investments is going to affect your bottom line. It's going to affect your profits. And you have to think to yourself, yes, the major cities have these giant rooms. 
But in small town America, nobody has seen what you're what you're capable of just yet. So why are you pulling out all the tricks? And I say this, I opened in a market that had a five wits. If you've ever had a five wits in your area, you know exactly what that means. If you don't, it thinks Universal Studios and Escape Rooms had a baby. Okay, and it is just hugely immersive and like crazy cool and you just do all these like ridiculous things with tech. I was like, well, that's awesome for them, but that doesn't work for me. I can't, I can't chase that. All I can do is have a safe environment for people to have a really, really great time and be able to, you know, make a tiny bit of money. It worked for me. It, you know, I, and my advice is it can work for you too. You just have to be, be smart about it. It's a business. Yeah, I think um, my personal observation, the industry as a whole, we've sort of like exploded really quickly from this basic lock and key model to now everybody and paper. And paper. Yeah, everybody's thinking, I need all this tech. Um, when most of the times we play a lot of games, you don't need that tech. So I think it's just the, finding the fine line of using tech when it's Makes sense. Not just to use that. Yeah. You're not just doing it because you have to. Like um, tech on its own is never going to be enough. I mean, you have to have yeah. all the elements to have a great game. Yes, and I think that all of you here have taken the steps to see the trends because you're here. We paid to be here, and I think that's important for your business as well. So when you're looking at just the current trends in technology, you'll see it on the floor. But there's that is what it is. That's just the tech. It's how you find an innovative way. To thread it into your experience and make it like Scott Nicholson says in the ask why like why is it here why are you doing this how does it add to my storyline and my uh, game flow which is important so the trends are there to see but what you do with them is what can make them really special you know and different and not just you know Brian said earlier like how many times can you just like put something down somewhere and it opens something and that's tech, but that's not a puzzle, right? That's not how it, it works into the game. So I think a lot of people are buying plug and play things that's just like, we're gonna fill the hour with things to, and of course, pattern recognition and colors and things like that are puzzles, but I think that filling, I don't, I don't think the trend of technology is having your room filled up with all of these RFIDs and meat switches and Arduinos in every corner that don't really um, you know, correlate to what you're trying to convey to the customer and the player experience. So, yeah, I think that the trends are out there, but how you use it is how it's gonna make you unique in your market. I also think from, from the flip side, so from just personally watching the vendors, I think from I four years ago, oh, yeah. you saw a lot of vendors that had standalone products that you could buy and easily integrate into a game. Oh, that's gonna work for that <laughs> team, and this is gonna work for that team. And moving fast forwarding to today, as you probably walked on the show floor, that it seems to be driven towards selling you a turnkey game versus selling or just selling tech elements that you have to build yourself so I thought that's really interesting so that we had a conversation about this last night in preparation for this talk and actually I spoke to some of the vendors last evening and here's why so many people have been purchasing the plug, plug and play props and coming back to said vendors and saying this doesn't work for my game I want my money back or your I need seven of these because you know they make my game great and they keep they keep going in. what was happening is there was a lot of games being produced that these vendors would go to see and be like i don't understand why they spent so much money this game is is terrible and they're going to go out of business so it was almost like they're giving the tools out when we really just need the finished product um and that was kind of their perspective which i thought was very very interesting um but they said look we're in this to make money, yes, but we're also in this because we need the industry to survive. So I think that was very bold um, of a lot of them, but thinking about it, it makes more sense. You know, I think the biggest thing that I'm learning more and more is that we do need to slow down and we need to realize what, what we're doing in order to sustain. And I think they kind of feel the same way. I think we should also expand the definition of tech when we're talking about it. Mm, sure. I mean, because in, in my mind where I think at least for my company where I want to go, because I also got in with extremely low tech as in put something down and it opens something else. But we want to get into more tech that talks about sound and lighting effects and more of the theatrical style of tech. And I think that's where I, I hope to see at least me go because that's something that I want to produce better. Um, because I think that can really add to your storyline and your theming and make a 
ton more sense than in an ancient Egyptian room, you know, something opens because of an RFID prop. Um, not to say that's a bad thing. Like, I, I also think it's a balance. That's me personally. We have a Sherlock room. It has one teeny tiny tech element, but the majority <coughs> of my people are still first, second, third timers. And it gets a surprise, excited reaction every single time. It's because it's the only one. You do, spoiler alert, open my fireplace, but it is not done by tech. What? It is, I know, sorry. <laughs> we use an old school fence opening, like the, and, and it's a fun pull and play and, and whatnot, but we didn't put tech in it because it's it's Sherlock. Like, I give you air conditioning and light. I mean, you can do that, so we really took a stretch on that. All right, so we're gonna just stop right there and change gears a little bit so then that way. Uh, sorry, Ginsburg, I don't even want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Ginsburg. Um, so all of that being said, I do stay mindful of safety guidelines without letting it impact that customer experience. Do you want to start with Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah anybody. I'm going to have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, safety is the utmost importance of the whole thing. If we're not safe, we don't have business at all. Um, it, it's up to you on what you want to do. If you, you know, there's guidelines in IBC or the all of those codes and laws and you've got to follow them. There's a reason they're there. Uh, you side skirt those, great. You're gonna get away with it until you don't. When you don't, you're just done. Um, and we, everyone knows about the whole Fulman thing. It, five people lost their life because they were not careful. Don't let that be you. It, it's that simple. Don't let that be you. You've got to be safe. There's no way getting around that. If after the Poland thing, you didn't take a step back and look at your games and think, is this something that we need to do? Can we change this to make it safer? Or in the future, are we going to need to change games to where doors are always unlocked? Or And and it's going to be whatever fits your business. But I know that's the first thing we did was like, Absolutely. do we need this final door lock? Do we need a key for this? Can it be an objective-based game? Can it be finding this instead of escaping the room? I mean. It's just silly to think that you can't have a great experience without having the door locked. And I think that a lot of times you go into rooms that you've seen, clearly spent a ton of money on gorgeous scenic and, and props, and then you see these clear safety issues. It's like you need to spend the money there first and then see what you have for the rest of it. It's the unsexy way to spend money. Right. It's not safety. It's the like, non-fun way. way. It's the non-fun way. Yeah. And none of us want to do it. I mean, we want to do it to keep our clients safe, but obviously a lot of these specifications come with a hefty price tag and it's a hard pill to swallow when you're looking at an overall budget and you're like oh that's a lot of money to you know put in the proper fire safety you know i know that the ibc code just came out for 2020 and it's a it's got a lot of expensive changes in there so you definitely want to look at that first in the budgeting of opening and if you're already open like we said take a step back and really evaluate where we are and like David and Lisa are in the back and they, they are writing now about the safety of each room as a part of their reviews. And I think that's brilliant and I think it's important to note that because it needs to be called out. Because there's so many times you walk in a room and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm handcuffed under this desk. And I can't undo it. And if the, you know, and I know there's a lot of ifs, but I'm sure those five teenagers celebrating a birthday party, you know, it's, it's the most devastating the most devastating thing I've read in a long time is that story about Poland. So I think that safety should be above everything. And I think that your customers notice, like they clearly notice <coughs> that you've taken, you know, that next step to make them feel safe. We, we try to always go over, obviously, all the safety aspects of the room. Um, but I think was it us three, we played a room where the game master is listening on a baby monitor we were locked in, like the door closed, and we couldn't, he couldn't hear us to communicate, we couldn't get out. And someone had touched real barbed wire, and a fence fell on her. Like this was a real situation with owners playing, and they were just like, oh, that never happens. Like it was, so you need, you don't think that, oh, it will pull in, you know, they don't have the same codes and stuff, but people are doing those things around here, and it's gonna take one, big thing like Poland to happen in the U.S. that's going to affect everybody. So take the time and focus on your safety. 
So um, I come from the hot house industry, and something that's been like kind of honed into me for the last since the beginning is the possibility of having hundreds of people in one space and a fire starting and needing to get those people out. I've um, witnessed not well witnessed video, I'll say, of like extreme situations with nightclubs and understanding that if there is a fire, okay. <clears throat> there's a panic that goes with it. So do not ever rely on your game master is going to get your people out safely. Your game master might not even know what to do at that point or be able to get out. What you have to realize is your space, the way that it is, what happens if you were even in there and there was a fire? Do you know exactly how to get out from any, any space that you're in? I can guarantee that most of you don't. You, you don't know what you would do, even if you were in your bathroom, how to get out of your space if there was a fire. My analogy has always been, you have to understand that intellect of everyone is different. So even if you had, and I'm gonna really go for it, a group of special needs kids in your area, can you safely say, in 100% confidence, that they would have no problem getting out of your space in an emergency? Think about it that way. Because that situation with Poland, those kids have done fire drills. Those kids have been through emergency situations, trained since they were little. And in that event, they were not able to get out of that situation. So, going back to like getting off fire, this this, this <coughs> happened to us personally. Um, our Appleton location is across from an elementary school, and they uh, the city. So I believe it was someone from the police department um, stopped by to talk about possibly scheduling a, a lockdown scenario, which. It's terrible that that has to be done, right? But that's the world now. And I never, like it was a check mark for me, I never thought about that. Like if something were to happen and I have customers in my building, where do they go? Like last year we had a tornado warning with customers and the power out. Yes, the emergency lights went on, but- Or bird boxes. So I'm, so I'm, I'm after that, that, I'm that I had to call and say to the building inspector, like, where do I take my customers if there were a tornado? We don't have a basement. And we have to shove all of our customers within two bathrooms. Like, that's- Right, right. no, and it's scary. Are, but we run- You have to sort of process all of those things. We are easy. going to do our second active shooter training for our employees. And I know that's extreme and I know that's really sad. Our mall, um, so side note for through the haunted house, our team does the moulage for active shooter plane crashes, um, mass casualty events. So we got into that a couple of years ago, but in our area, um, we've been running them through schools, we've been running them through businesses, they're doing it everywhere. And our police department, because we're in an area that's a high threat, is offering it to business owners. Um, Guess what, guys? If somebody comes in with an active shooter, that's your insurance. So if you, you know, just just an extra food for thought on in terms of safety. One, you can never be too safe. But two, at the end of the day, if something happens in your business, you're responsible. And it, it's not if. In our society, it might be when. So my only advice is check what your coverage is, and also check with your employees too and see, you know, test them. Be like, hey, if there was ever a fire, how would you get out? And I guarantee every single one of them says something different. So just being aware. Also a tip for that, sorry. Just, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, this is a new thing that our fire inspector came up with for us after Poland. So it has a, a, a lot of you are open now. Did anybody get surprise inspections after Poland? We did, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, she passed, obviously. But I had asked, like, how can we be even better at it? So our, our staff are trained. Um, we keep an, each game master keeps an active count of how many people are in that hour. So when we, if there were a fire or some emergency that we have to exit the building, we, do you have a standard, do you know how many people were in your building? Do you know if there's anyone? And not you, just for bookie. You I legally do that have well. to tell like, the fire sure department has... everyone's accounted for, just like school, you know, so. Uh, just another thing that I never thought of. That really well, and that's something that you can actually learn from the haunters, yeah. and you can ask a haunter how they do that safely. Like we have an active list that we make everybody punch in, but we also make everybody check in for, in terms of our actors, so that we know what actor is in what quadrant at all times. <laughs> and then we also have an active system with um, our tracking and our ticket people that they click, 
and they know exactly how many people are in on one side and we have somebody at the end that's clicking everybody out. You'll see large theme parks do that, that's why. They don't really care about the attendance numbers, they care if something goes down, how many people are on the property and what is the risk assessment in terms of casualties and, and those possibilities. So at any given time, even in your facility, are you counting that, that mom that's in the bathroom while her kids are playing? Are you aware of where those people are? It's important. All right, so we're gonna stop it right there because uh, we can talk about safety probably for the entire hour. Um, I think it's important just be safe and use your resources. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, last predetermined question that we have, and then we'll turn it over to you guys for Q and A. Uh, Want to kind of challenge the panel a little bit, um, and what are some major keys to keeping the industry strong that have not already been mentioned? So I know you guys talked a lot about reinvesting in the business, the tech. You know all of the different things that we've already discovered or talked about but what are some things that maybe we don't talk about enough that you think will keep the industry strong as we move forward customer service uh, damn it customer service Moving on. Um, no. we, you know like little things like answering the phone answer the phone return emails return um voice yeah voicemails emails um, you know, we do a huge corporate team building business and I've got an amazing competitor a mile away. Andrew doesn't answer an email, I'm getting one right after. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if I don't answer that email right away, he's going to get it. Time. They're going to go to the next one and we talk about it and we laugh about it. So respond in a prompt manner. It's so important. And it's annoying because they call all the time and ask you everything that's clearly listed on your website. But be kind and courteous and customer service. It should go safety, customer service. You know, because it is above all, like Brian said, it's a business. And it needs to be the customer's always right. I, I see a lot of things on the message boards that are like, mm, I know, we, we, dis that. we disagree. We butt heads on that. We butt heads on that. Yeah. On what? What are you doing? So I think there's a fine line between customer service and training your customer to act poorly. I disagree. He thinks I pander. I do a little bit. <laughs> so here's a scenario. Someone, oh, Lord. <laughs> this, this is a real scenario that we argued over. Um, uh, a fellow owner of ours had a Valentine's Day promo code that ended on Valentine's Day. Clearly said it ends on Valentine's Day. A week and a half later, this woman is fighting. She wants that promo code a week and a half later. She said, "Do I just give it to her?" Yep. In I my opinion, I don't agree. Mm, that right I think you can there. still give her a discount. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Yes, but you you say Linda, listen, that <laughs> listen that promo code has expired. But lucky for you, I have a ten percent off promo that just started. Linda doesn't know that you didn't have that promo code, right? Linda thinks she kind of got her way, but she still didn't. You're you're not training Linda that whenever she wants, she can call and say, I want that promo code. From, her way is just faster and easier. Yeah, yeah. So. I want to bring up a point that I, I mean, I might be neurotic about this, but um, our phones, phone calls. Phone calls are a hot button issue with me. If somebody is calling you, it's because they want an answer right then and there. And yes, they may be stubborn and crazy, um, but my children for the longest time thought that you answered a phone. Thank you for calling us, the estate. My mom can see that too. <laughs> yeah, no, and they would answer my phone like that constantly. And it was because the phone still to this day rings after the store hours are closed rings to me, then rings to my business partner, and then rings to my husband. And so some way, somehow, one of us is getting that phone. Now, is it annoying to answer the phone in the grocery store? Yes. Yeah. However, does that customer know you're in the grocery store? No. And if they do, they're impressed that you Oh, yeah. The phone. Trust me, sometimes I'll name drop it. And I'm like, I'm in line at Universal Studios right now, but if you can hold on one second, I can get out of this line, I can take your booking, and I will make sure you're all set. Usually that only happens when the storefront is extremely busy, and I am so excited that the storefront's that busy that the phone's running, ringing to me. Um, but remembering that. And there's sometimes that I'm out of touch with my business, but I'm still answering the phones. Um, we also got that text widget, which I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not hugely a fan of it, but it, it works. It works. Texting. So, so the, in the interest of um, adding as much value as possible, um, yeah, is what are some? No, I, I think it's a great point. I just think that 
what else in addition to customer service, if anything, to keep the industry strong um, can we do that we don't hear about enough in your opinion? So it sounds like customer service specifically about answering the phone or just responding to customers in general, uh, which again, I think has definitely been hammered home. Is there any other issues you guys like to talk about? I think part of it is that um, I'm gonna talk about for at least knowing that my business is getting stronger is finding a community to connect with. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And I think as we continue to grow and we've got conferences and conventions and and all these things, um, I know locally we meet up um, as an owners group. Not everybody, and that's totally fine. Um, but we want the Portland market to be strong. So we talk about what we can do in general to do better. Um, these guys here are pretty much um, we talk daily. Yeah. about what's happening um, and, and it, because I take inspiration from them they see different things in their markets um, and we keep trying to get stronger as a group um, whatever that fancy rising tides and ships, ships and all that good stuff yeah. like that's really true um, and I have zero issue sharing a lot of my things with my local uh, I say competitors but other local companies um, because if we can make Portland a destination for people to come and play, that's better for all of us, including me. Um, so I, I think that's kind of a thing to, to make the industry stronger going forward, um, is that we do try to collectively work together, um, while still, I think, the hard part maintaining individuality and like you know, having your own <coughs> little uh, niche and, and what you want to provide. Um, it is hilarious to go to like certain regional areas and see the exact same thing there and they are shocked that nobody else does it and we are shocked that they all do it um it's really funny to see whether that's a puzzle or writing on the walls or you know cell phones or whatever the case is so just interesting so i think um you know, utilize everybody else that you get to come in contact with here the networking here is fantastic well i often think about like how the human oh. was say, I thought lucas and brian i think have something to add so we'll let them go ahead um, Phone just fell out of my back. Sorry about that. The biggest thing I, I've known it, but I, I was reminded of it last night is you need to do you. Quit worrying about everybody else. What works for you is fantastic and is great. None of us are in the exact same situations. And so what works for me does not necessarily work for any of them. I was giving one of our friends crap last night because we're at dinner and she's still answering her phone. I haven't answered my phone for a phone call from a store in over three years. I also have a different totally strokes. different situation yeah, different than strokes. she is. And, and I sat there and I was judging her for it. It's like, no, grow your business. Just quit answering your phone, get someone else to do it. But that's what works for her. And she needs to continue to do what works for her. And you need to do what works for you until you can get to the point where you can have a different solution. Lucas? I don't really have much to add. I think having a community is important. I do think, you know, like not worrying about what other people are doing, but also at the same time uh, communicating with them what you're doing or what they're doing. Well, also <coughs> because like if I'm opening this type of room and you're also about to open that type of room and the other guy down the street's about to open that type of room, that's not good for the industry um, for everybody to have the same stuff. I mean, the it's already a one time play thing and be and you know, we are we opened at about the same time as another place in town, and we both have an Egyptian room. Um, there's not really much we can do about it at this point. The same, they're not even really similar um, in a lot of ways. But pe customers don't know that. Customers still think every escape game is the same company, no matter what kind of market you're doing, no matter your brand awareness. Everybody thinks like, oh, I bought a Groupon for your escape game, and I'm like, well, we're not on Groupon. So, but, I mean, that's the. I, I think being um, transparent <coughs> and, and having a relationship with escape games in your area is a big um, service for the industry and is helpful for the customers. Um, and you don't have to share numbers necessarily and you don't have to give away your secrets or anything like that, but just meeting with them and having a talk can help with a lot of things. And I just wanted to tack onto that really quickly, I'm sorry, is that um, as something in the industry, like they say, that isn't talked about often, is please take constructive criticism from that community. Um, whether it be the enthusiasts that, and you know, we don't cater to enthusiasts, but they do have a lot of experience or other owners in your circles. So this is like a totally finite little example, but like Eric came to my shore, he's like, it's great, you need to paint the ceilings black. 
I was like, you know what, I know, I just haven't, I've been, I've been thinking about it. And then he was like, no, you really should. Next week, I had them all painted black. And it made a big difference. I was like, thank you. But I could have been like, it's fine, whatever. You know, like, I find a lot of people get very defensive of their locations and their games, and I understand that because it's their babies, and it's my baby too, and I love it. But we, every time someone plays that's played a lot of escape games, I am in their face or emailing them, please tell me what you loved, what you hated. You ever, did you feel frustrated at any point? Like where, do, have you seen this a million times? Have you not? And just take the criticism, even if you don't agree. Even if you're like, I've seen a lot of groups and they've all been fine with it. Just take it, listen to it, and it might not work for you, and it might. But I really think a lot of people shut down immediately and they get very defensive instead of just listening. Instead, same like we're responding to reviews. Listen, wait, then respond. Well, oh, that was what I was with. Okay, two things. We are creators, we are innovators. Don't stop yourself. Don't think, it's an Egyptian room, I have to have this. It's a jailbreak room, I have to have this. That's where we're pigeonholing our customer base to. That's where we're training them to, is that those six escape rooms that they've played and three of them have been Egyptian, that's why they're calling Lucas and saying, are they the same one? Because that's how they're seeing it. They're seeing it as the same. They're not identifying with the puzzles. They're not identifying with anything else. I'll be honest, I've never done, I've never created an Egyptian room. My, my style is creating something that you're not seeing anywhere else to the best of my ability. That's my style though. Not to say that anybody else is doing it wrong. I'm just wanna throw it out there. Be innovative, be creative. The other thing is with customer service, I constantly see on the message boards where people are like, how do I respond to this? I know you're angry, I know you're upset, I know you're frustrated because I'm doing the same thing with my customers at home. I'm sending messages to my employees or other people and I'm like, Brah! The immediate thing that I do is, thank you so much for your feedback. I'd like some time to review this and I'll get back to you. I'm gonna give myself and that customer 12 hours because we both need to calm down. We both need to think about this for what it is. It's an experience at a business. Did they pay for it? Absolutely. Are you paying for it on the other side? Absolutely. Your customer service problems are problems, but there's also solutions as well. Take your time. You don't need to respond right away. They go to TripAdvisor, they go anywhere else, guess what? Once you send that email back to them with the solution, you send it to TripAdvisor, you send it to Yelp, you send it to Facebook, and you ask them kindly to remove it as you've already addressed the situation. I've never had a problem having anything removed like that. Granted, I've only had two, but sending them the clear cut, concise problem solve that you've attempted as a business owner, will get that review removed. Beautiful. 30 seconds. Go. Even better. Um, I think you guys should look at it anytime that there's a, a customer issue or whatnot as an actual opportunity to turn it into a wow moment. Yeah. And that sounds really cheesy, but like, you can use that opportunity to A, learn from your current processes and procedures, train your team better, and actually make a customer feel like you actually care. That is not something that is found in all industries anywhere. So you can take that moment, you can get frustrated, totally fine, give it 12 hours, and then figure out a way to make it even better and just go to town and make them feel special, and then use it as a training opportunity too. Like, it took me a long time to get there, but now, like, it, I, I don't want to say I get excited, but I'm killing it. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's 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 create some more wow moments and turn it over to these guys for Ooh. some questions. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yay. Uh, Coming in hot on the left. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, before we do it, just a quick reminder. Again, if you have a question for a specific panel member, please make sure that you do that when you're addressing the question. And then also, just as a reminder to the panel, we're going to ask that just one person respond with an additional person reserving the right to either rebut or add on. Uh, but we'll limit it to two. And again, about 60 to 90 seconds apiece. We have just a hair over 20 minutes left. So I want to make sure we get to as many of them as possible. So I saw one hand up already. So we're going to go there. And then I'll try my very best to keep everyone um, in line. So we'll start right here at the front. Uh, it's a pretty specific question. Um, I'm wondering, you know, since we put a lot of creative energy into building a room, um, how far in distance is it appropriate to copy that room and repeat it? Like, I know some people do across town. You know, is it a 10 mile radius where you're gonna reach new customers, 20, 30? You know, how far, you know, how big of a city is it reasonable to have this, your same exact room across town? Oh, you mean like you purchased yeah. a room? No, no, you make a room. And you have like two say, locations. Hey, look, it's working. I mean, so let's put it across town. I have two locations that are eight miles apart. 
not not even like seven miles apart, but we do completely different games. Right, no, no, my specific question is is so, how far yeah. if you're gonna have a second location, can you use the exact same game? Oh, that's I'd say same one hour. Game. It's, it's game game. The escape, escape game, game in Nashville has three locations. They have three gold ru or two gold rushes. Two. They have just about two of everything. And I mean, I don't think they're hurting. So uh, yeah. it just depends on like, population, awesome. how many tourists it's come to your specific, town. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's going to be very specific about and and how many games. I mean, they're essentially the only person in Nashville. I mean, there are two or three others in the area, and, and there's one other downtown. But they have so much of the market share that population, so, tourist, and that are going to be the determining factors. I think for for most of those things. I have two locations, 22 miles apart. They have some. They have. Different and the same games. Um, it depends on your market. The people from one store do not drive the 22 miles because it takes almost an hour, and so you don't get the cost. It just depends on your market. You know. I think in Manhattan you could have them seven blocks apart. Right. <laughs> Honestly, like, it's hilarious to me because they're like, "Oh, I don't go a five block radius from where I live," so it, it's market specific. Uh, we have one out here. How long is it that you have a room? That you're gonna flip it to another to a new room. How long? Market specific. Oh, yeah, market market specific. Well, I don't think it's a market. Part? I think from. Are you talking about yeah, running sure. time of a room? Sure. No. no. How long you got a room? Running? Running? Okay, we're gonna we're ready out. to start a whole new room in this room. Now it's flipping again. And we're like, okay, so now. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a trouble. You mean like flipping it? Like when? Yeah. Flip it. It. Yeah. I think it, for me personally, it's so you can't wait until it's not selling because then you're losing money, but you don't want to cut it out too early. We had a room that was running for like four years and it was just, it was still booking, but our staff's getting bored. I'm getting bored with it. It was getting tired. So, okay, yeah, let's flip it. But, so I think it's it's probably less than market specific, more personally. Yeah, I mean, we see uh, yeah, I think a huge increase when we well, flip a room. Yeah. Um, your it's sales, it's not the sales are ever going one. down because of the room. But you get a spike, a spike and you stay, stay like up there by flipping a room. It also depends on the size of the room. A four person, you know, a smaller game is gonna last a lot longer. It's gonna see a lot less people in uh, <coughs> like a poke population. population. Yeah. yeah, there's just there's so there's many. Not, there's not a good answer factors. because it's yeah. not a, good answer. a million different variations. If you're in a big city, if you're in a small city, I, totally it's not so a, hard. It's a good question. It, it is, is a good question. question. <laughs> you might wanna flip it because every other game in town that has opened after you is now is super upgrading. nice and yeah, your upgrading. game wasn't and yeah. you might just feel like well I, I need to be able to get on that same level or i need to i need to grow and so it could be a decision for you not necessarily how your bookings are going but customers ask us how often do you flip your games and we just say yes <laughs> great answer great answer i have a question right over here and then i believe one back there um, so I also operate a haunted attraction. So when I opened my escape room business, I said, I would like to open something that's not scary, you know, do something that's new. Um, however, I found a lot of my customers are looking for a scary room. So I was wondering, uh, have you found more success in scary themed rooms or non-scary? So before we have anybody answer, does anyone currently do scary themed rooms or have you ever? So then we'll let these do answer that question for you. Um, so we started off with creep, uh, or a little bit creepy. Our very first experience was inside our haunted house. So it had that spooky element to it. Um, we found huge success with that. But then when we branched off and went outside of our haunted house, we had to run a no thrills, no chills, just fun type campaign um, because we were saying we produced this experience. The in, the in the last year, we brought back a scary experience and it did really really well my advice to you is you have to know what audience you're marketing it to if you're marketing it consistently to the same people that are playing your traditional escape rooms it's not the same market market to your escape to your haunted house attendees now when I say that though not everybody that goes to a haunt wants to go into a scary room and not everybody that wants to go into a scary room wants to go to a haunted house so you're almost creating yourself a third business model when you're when you're doing it, and so for me, I found that like ours was an ex is very extreme, you know. Um, but I found that it is a completely different market than than our other two, four, five, or whatever. So we ended up closing our scary room because it was negatively impacting our like. You need to realize you can't just market to the people who like the scary. And even if you have non-scary rooms and one scary room, 
the people that go and say, we did that escape room thing last night, they put a hood over our head and they lock, and I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to do, like, all the non-scary customer years is the scary stuff. They don't, they're not learning that you have other things. We've even had to change our, rebrand our logo a bit because we had like a cracked style font in the text. People thought it was scary. Escape the State's gone through three logo changes and four rebrandings because of that. But I think lean into your strength too, though. So like yeah, yeah. maybe do one scary room, you know, yeah. and others. And I think that you know some of the Canadian owners were saying their scary room hands down always books the most, always. But maybe because you don't, they don't have a lot of haunts. Yeah. I'm in South Louisiana. I've got haunts all over the place. <laughs> so we aren't scary. You guys have one. I can't do it. Is okay. You know, I know I can't do it. And two, we've got a customer base that won't go there because they, they're scared so they we've got some like eerie themes but no actors or jump scares like that so you yeah, have several escape games that are pure just just horror, horror based. and scary themes and, and they do fine so i mean you definitely can so it just depends on what you want to do what you're better at what suits you so yeah. Yeah. so you're saying maybe just like in the haunt industry how extreme haunts are too segmented you're saying maybe it can be a horror theme, but don't you know lock them up with a, right. You know, or just one. Right. right. The other thing with it is give as much information about the room as possible. Like have its own FAQs because people people yeah, are terrified. Once they hear it's scary or dark, yeah. they're they're out and then they're being locked in a room and there's an actor in there. Like, and and we went about it like a very funny way and be like, is there an actor in the room? Yep, sure is, but don't worry. They're not there to scare you, we promise. You know, something like that that gives them, you need to reassure them. The other thing that you don't think about or I didn't think about is there's one, like our, our game, our serial killer game was private booking. One person books that, typically a male for that room for us, and then they arrive with their wives, girlfriends who don't want to play. Mm -hmm. they, they, and you're instantly, before they even get in the room, are, they're creating a negative experience for your customer before you can even get them in the room. These are first time players that you want to be excited about the game and they're already shaking in their boots in the briefing because you're like, I'm about to put a hood over your head and take you in one at a time. You know? <laughs> 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 All right, we have several more hands in here, so we're gonna move on, we're gonna move on. Um, who's? It was. Uh, it was back there somewhere. Yeah, go ahead and then we'll come up here. Yeah. Sure, so can I just get everybody to spit out their price point real quick? Sure. And then I want to get your guys' opinion on why don't people come back? Because right? I do a lot of talking to people that don't come back, and I try to figure out why they're not coming back. So everyone price point two people why they don't come back. You guys can choose. I'll go price point. We'll go down the line. Um, depending on the market, I'm anywhere from twenty two to twenty nine dollars. Thirty dollars. Uh, twenty eight and thirty two. Twenty eight. Twenty five to thirty depending on the day. Twenty five, twenty nine. Why I think people don't come back? They missed their wild moment. I think people do come back. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We have, um, we have a really high retention. So I think it's the experience, you know. It's, it's Are they filled with anxiety going in? Are they um, customer service? Do they feel at home? Do they want to go come with their office and then want to come with their friends and then want to bring their family and then want to bring, you know, that's the beauty of escape rooms, I think. It's all walks of life. I love it. Watching people come in with someone that's in their 80s and someone that's 9 and 10 and, like, they're all engaged and enjoying it. So, um so just uh, just in all fairness, I think everyone can agree that customers come back and we know why. I think his his question is, what are the reasons that they're not coming yeah, back? You missed your wow moment. Maybe. I think, honestly, it's also not a game for everybody, and we yeah. have to yeah, realize that. True. Like, you can't go in and expect that a hundred percent of people coming into your room like this is their jam. Like my boyfriend does like them. Yeah. My boyfriend does them when I drag him to them. <laughs> it's not his jam, um, and he actively got out of the one I scheduled for this week. Um, so, <laughs> um, and, and and that's totally fine. Um, but then then you do have to get feedback, and that's a great way to go about it. Asking them the why's. Is it something you can fix, or is it just maybe this isn't their thing? Yeah, it's not yeah. everybody's gonna come. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. We have a business partner whose wife hates his game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, think it's about it. Like, bowling, right? I played bowling like once in my life. I was like, that was fun. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it again, you know, and that's okay. All right. So I think you, you, you I mean, over there somewhere for ten and fifteen minute rooms. Is that something that we're doing? Is that the? I would advocate hugely for them. I've been doing them for years, hundred percent, every day, all day. I would go strongly against I that. Way and, uh, way too. 
<laughs> so my, my hard yes is you can fit 20 people through a room in an hour. Done correctly. What's your hard the yes? profit margins yes. on that are, are huge. I run a 20 minute experience all day, every day at Museum of Venture. We do 20, 40, and 60 minutes. Our 20 and 40 <laughs> minutes are, are by, by far outbook our 60 minutes. Oh. He's played them. Just just curious, how do you make sure that people are actually in the room with the 20 minute experience for 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously with timers and whatever, the it ends up being 30 minutes because their start time and their end time are still really high. But that is, it, you still have the start time and end time to a 60 minute room as well. And most people can probably agree, they're gonna be in your facility for about 90 minutes. You know, so. All right, we have 10 minutes left, so we're gonna. The museum is wonderful, but it is so different. different. Yeah. But I've been running five minute, 10 minute, and 20 minute experiences since I opened. I just, Through I don't think there's haunted enough houses, time obviously either. different, but yeah. Europe, but, but even in our storefront. Yeah, not enough time to go through it. I think there are definitely been arguments for both sides. Like I said, we have 10 minutes. Uh, so where did I leave off? Was I, was I here? I think it was there first, than me. Okay. Go ahead. I'm a newbie, have just a few questions. Uh, the first one is, are magmite models safe? Yes. yes. Can be. They are. If they, if they, when when used correctly, yes. Right? They're considered safe. Yeah. Um, where are the message boards? Like Facebook. 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 Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Take them with a grain of salt. Take them with a grain of salt. They can be helpful. A pound. They can be helpful. Right. Probably Next with a grain of salt. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you can Google things too rather than put it in there. A lot of the questions in there should just be Google. And then finally, what's the general consensus on group on? Don't. Oh. <laughs> well, there you go. All right. They're on the trade floor. You can talk to them. <laughs> so if you want to talk to somebody that's currently using it, yes, I will talk to you about it. I've never used it in the traditional escape room model, though. We're using it for intrigue, and I can give you some points. There is a place for group on. It is a marketing tool, and if you account for it as marketing, it can be good. Mm -hmm. But there is a huge downside to it as well, mm -hmm. and you've got to be prepared for both. Beautiful, great. Right. So, I, got, I know most of you guys. Um, <clears throat> this is more. I want you guys to speak to something. Uh, <clears throat> I've been open for four years now, or just under four years. And in my talks with other owners, I find that owners, especially newer ones, don't value their time properly, or don't put a good dollar figure to the amount of time that they're spending on games or running their business. And they usually get in their own way. Can you guys maybe give some of the new owners some advice on how to get out of their way and actually when building a game or costing out their business to, to give themselves a good value dollar and stop building stuff and putting themselves down at $20 an hour or $15 an hour, I think it would be really important for the new people to actually value their time more. And you guys have been in the industry a long time as well, so maybe some advice for people out here. I think you answered it. Yeah, and yeah. I think Brian always says, like, yeah, I, if I don't know how to do marketing, I just hire that out. If I don't know how to, you know, do the scenic, I hire it out. Like, I think it's important to know your strengths also. Mm -hmm. So you know your worth, but you also know, like, I can't pay a rent. You know, like, I you have to hire that stuff out. So I think that, I don't really know. You have to get there, though. You yeah, you just to find your way. Find your way. Decide, I'm going to hire a marketing person. I'm right. going to hire a web guy. I'm going to hire an HR person, a county. At some point, you have to graduate to that. Um, I mean, I started, I, I was it. Um, I had a business partner that didn't do crap, and it was me and him. And from there, uh, I'm really proud to say I have over 80 employees now. I, I haven't answered a phone in three years from the store, but that's because I grew to that point. Um, yeah. You know, well, but, but even in the beginning, though, think about it. Like when you were doing it, were you exhausted on a lot of the things you were doing? That's Absolutely. Right. I didn't take any yeah. money yeah. for four or five months. Yeah. I think it's important if you are doing everything to have a schedule for yourself. That's a lot of something that, like, I learned very quickly as, you know, leave the escape room and I'm still working on marketing things. And, I, you know, now I sit down with a calendar for every week I do, you know, three hours of marketing. I do, you know, uh, actually three hours of research, market research. What new escape rooms are opening? What are their themes? What are the escape rooms around me doing? So just have a sort of set schedule so you're not burning yourself out because that's yeah. when you're going to start that. And also reevaluate your plan like every three months because like I, I had to constantly hear from this one down here that I'm doing way too much, way too much, way too much. Got to the point where, yeah, you have to reevaluate and be prepared. Prepare for it. 
How are you going to go when you burn out of marketing? Where are you going to go? When you burn out of the HR stuff, what are you going to do? All right, rapid fire. We've got about five minutes right left. So. Oh, he's been having his hand up for a while. Yes, yeah, so right oh, right. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go So, uh, oh, oh look. <laughs> go ahead. They yes. get a clue. He just what, what, what is Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Is it me? Yeah. Get a clue. Get a clue. Get a clue. Get a clue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the ratio? What do you find the ratio to be between um, first time escape room customers and people, you know, who've done rooms in other places? And what are your thoughts about bringing new people to escape rooms? Mine's still 78% new, and I say that's one to two. One to two rooms. Um, then the next jump is very quickly leading up to five to ten, um, and then we, we put it straight on our waivers. So I get waivers. every single like that is so important for me to know. To get and that information. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm mad I didn't start with it. Um, so I've been doing a survey for every Uber and Lyft that we've been in this weekend, and I asked the driver, "Have you heard of an escape game? Have you played, etc." And I think that like eight, out of, eight out of the yeah like eight of the people that we've ridden in, they have no idea what an escape room is. And only like one had played. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just think there's a lot of new. Yeah, there's just a lot of new customers. I mean, there's the still escape so game many mentioned people. it in the um, keynote speech last year that they had done a bunch of research and it was still like I think 10 percent of the United States had played or even heard of it, and so it's a bright line. All right, go ahead. So, um, and then we'll go. Be I have a question. We we uh, a little backstory. We got hit up in Tennessee by. A, uh, old organization that got approved um, funding, or I, got, I guess the law got passed in the state of Tennessee about 2008, they finally got funding in 2017, and started going around to um, escape rooms uh, to add an additional certification for each room. Okay, that's fine, um, there's a whole, that's a whole long story. However, it's got me thinking, well, what if you know, this continues to become an increased burden where it's not at the level of fair. We talk a lot about an industry. But I don't know who our industry is you're, other than when I come here. You're trying to figure out, do we have any pull with anybody? Is no, there an industry? We, have we don't have down. a governing body. We don't have is an there really a huge attraction? David and Lisa. Yeah. We're, we are doing, so there, there are new fire codes that are being announced. There's new policies that are being set that are working, that are going to go into effect in 2021. There were 15 people at the safety talk the other day, um, but the policies are really serious. They're not set in stone. We aren't an industry organization over here at Room Escape Artists, but we're going to do our best to fill that role for this because we need to organize everybody to set sensible safety standards that help protect players, help protect owners, help protect employees, help protect firefighters but don't do it in a way that destroys this entire business. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be putting out an analysis of those policies, those proposed policies, explaining what they mean and how you can comment on them and help push them into a proper direction. That's great. All right, and so we'll just want to get to one, another question, like I said. Uh,